I want to explain to you. All right? Why, why is knowing this, the effects of the sympathetic nervous system important? Let Timmy explain to you why. Watch. When a person comes into the emergency room and they're unconscious, besides rifling through their pockets and taking any valuable jewelry, what's the first thing a physician does? Checks their eyes. Why? Dilated or constricted, right? Watch. If a person is unconscious and they're overdosing on a drug like cocaine, say yeah. What will cocaine do to your pupils? It will dilate them, right? So the first thing they do is when they open up their eyes, they want to see the original size of the pupil and then they want to see if it re reacts to light. If the pupils are pinpoint, then that could mean they're on a drug that mimics what? What's the opposite of the sympathetic? The parasympathetic. So they could be do overdosing on heroin, barbiturates, and know this, the treatment for those overdoses are diametrically opposed. They're different. That's why understanding this stuff is important. And if you're a diabetic, a type 1 diabetic, and you're throwing up and having diarrhea, do you have to take more insulin or less insulin that day? you got to take more because when you're sick, you have dis-ease. Say yes. Your body's stressed. And what does the sympathetic nervous system do to your blood sugar? Well, the education continues. Here we go. I told you this. It's on the video. The control of blood sugar, say yes, and the sympathetic nervous system, sympathetic positive feedback, blood sugar negative, right? You can find any two other, one negative and one positive, say yeah. I gave you three negatives, you can look up a positive, say yeah. You know what, let me do that. In that video on homeostatic mechanism, did I go over childbirth in that? Okay, I'll give you a second positive feedback mechanism. Is that okay? Want me to do that? I already have it. What, what is it? The childbirth. Oh, really? Where'd you get I that? The book. I told you I read the book. <laughs> We're going to see how, you, you compare your answers. Here we go. All right, ready? Wait, 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 wait. All right, childbirth's a positive feedback mechanism. Are you with me? Okay, what's normal for your uterus? <laughs> okay, to contract or not contract? Not to contract. Are there times when you want the uterus to contract more than it should? Yes. When is that time? Very good. So I want this whole thing. Read your answer, make sure it matches up. Say yeah. Yep. All right, watch. When a woman's giving birth, right? And here comes Egbert. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And the baby's head hits the neck of the uterus. Neck, medical term for neck is cervix. cervix. You better write this down. Embedded in the muscular wall of the cervix are these little receptors called barrel receptors. Say yes. What do barrel receptors recept? And don't say bear. Pressure. Weight. Say yeah. Guys? And these receptors are nerves. Who's with me? Watch. And those nerves are going to stimulate what part of your brain? That's right. The hypothalamus. So watch. And I want this. So you got your H thal or P diddy or just diddy. 
So baryl receptors are going to stimulate the H thou baryl receptors. Say yeah, guys. Who's with me? What's the little dingleberry that hangs below the hypothalamus and is directly connected to it? The pituitary gland. Boom. And there are two lobes to the pituitary gland, an anterior and a posterior. Who's with me? So when barrel receptors are stimulated by pressure of the baby's head in the cervix, that's going to stimulate the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus is going to produce a hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin is produced in the hypothalamus, and then it's transported to the posterior pituitary, uh, pituitary gland. And the posterior pituitary gland then dumps the oxytocin into the blood. Say yes. Oxytocin has its effect on a lot of parts of the body. But watch, its most important function during child delivery is oxytocin, I want this, increases the force, say yes, increases the duration, dur, I can't say dur, a, a, shun. I got it, and it increases the frequency of uterine contractions. Now, watch. Once Egbert pops out, will there be any more pressure on the cervix? So the barrel receptors will no longer be stimulated, so the hypothalamus will no longer produce any more oxytocin, and the pituitary gland will not release anymore. Say yes. And because you're moving away from homeostasis, this is a positive feedback mechanism. Listen up, because this is true. Watch. Once the baby pops out, the the effect of oxytocin lasts for a couple of hours, sometimes days. And the purpose of that is when, what else you got to deliver after you deliver Egbert? The placenta. So once the placenta is removed, oxytocin still is high. And the reason for that is that it will constrict the muscles. And when it constricts the muscles, it squeezes off the blood vessels of the endometrial lining so the woman doesn't bleed to death. Say yeah. Watch. When a baby is born, first thing they do is suck out goods out of his nose, clean him off a little bit, do a quick APGAR score, and then poke his bottom of his foot and get some blood and check his blood work, right? Then they put some silver nitrate in his eyes so you don't get bacterial infections, say yeah. Then they swaddle the kid and put him in the mother's arms. And the reason they do that is because oxytocin levels are the highest right after birth. And oxytocin stimulates the limbic system to increase bonding between mother and child. That's why they want to get that baby into the mother's arms as soon as possible. And what they're doing now is they're giving guys nasal oxytocin during delivery so that they bond to the child too. For real. Tell me you got that. I want that. Did you have all that? Most of it. Yeah, well, now you got all of it. Education continues. Here we go. That's two positive feedback mechanisms. Are you with me? Okay. Switch gears here just a bit. What's the most important organic compounds in the human body? Uh, name them. What? Uh, lipids. Uh, 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 uh. Of these three, which is the most important? Amino, Amino acids. Say yes. yes. That's very good. Here we go. How many people have a body part that's nothing but fat besides fat? Is your left leg fat? Just pure fat. No. Is your right leg pure fat? No. Here we go. Watch. And I'm going to go through this real quick. We are combinations of those organic compounds. Who's following me? Watch. Watch. If you take a carb 
and you combined it with a protein, what do you get? A what? No, a carb. There you go, it's a glycoprotein. And glycoproteins are cell receptors. Who's with me? Guys? If you take a carb and a fat, what do you get? A glycolipid. Glycolipids are used as cell messengers. More on that later, following the 1030 movie. You got me? Cell membrane messengers. I'm, I'm sorry. Cell messengers. Say yeah. Guys? What's next? If you take a fat and a protein, what do you get? A lipoprotein. Give me an example of a lipoprotein. That's very good. You did good. I'm proud of you. Yeah. Everybody at the end of class, give Tanya 37 cents each. <laughs> cholesterol. Do you need cholesterol? Yes. Why? What's a steroid hormone? That's exactly right. Uh, Jennifer, shake his hand, okay? <laughs> Too lazy to get up. How many people followed this? Now watch. This is the important one. If you take a lipid and an inorganic compound, what inorganic compound am I thinking of? What inorganic compound do you think I'm thinking of? What's that? That's phosphate. So if you take lipid and a phosphate and you chemically combine it, what do you get? I'm waiting. Uh, you get a phospholipid. And what do phospholipids make up? There you go. All cell membranes are made of phospholipids. Now watch. I'm going to explain this to you. And everything that we learn right now, everything that we learn right now, I'm going to relate. Are you ready? Okay. What, is, what are cell membranes made out of? Phospholipids. How thick is a cell membrane? And you learn that all cell membranes are selectively permeable. Ain't that right? Okay, here we go. Where are we? Where the hell is it? Here we go. I'm going to run through this like diarrhea runs through it. Ready? Watch, what I'm going to show you right now is a cell membrane. A phospholipid bilayer. Say yeah. And in this video, it looks like what? No, don't that look like something? Don't that look? Look. What does that look like? Huh? What does that look like? Right there? Yeah. Like All right, that's not bad. Yeah, I see it. To me, it looks like spinach lasagna. Yeah. All right, I want this whole thing. Whole thing, peeps. What do I want? Whole thing. Yeah, right. What does every living cell have associated with it? Nope. Yeah. Oh, I better tell you. A capillary. How thick is a capillary? How thick is a cell membrane? Right. Now watch. This is really important. Really important. 
if a cell needs something to go into it, there's going to be a way that that cell gets the stuff in the blood to get inside that cell. Tell me you got that. Do all cells need the same stuff from the blood? No, they need different stuff. So one of the things that allows cells to get what they need, one of the ways, is through receptors being embedded in their cell membrane. Are you what are receptors made out of? We just, we just did it. We just did it. Uh huh. Glycoprotein. Say yes. Who's with me? You got me? How many people are following this so far? All right. Watch. You need to get this, and I'm going to make sure you get this. Hang on a second. Watch. What's this? What's this? What kind of cell? Right. You don't know. I haven't named it yet. Ready? Watch. Right. That's good. What's this? Good. What's this? That's a liver cell. Say yeah. Bless you. Ready? Who's with me so far? Okay, watch. I'm going to say this real slow because it's critical. This is one point, one junction in this class where you need to, you need to get this idea, right? There's a bunch of stuff in the blood, right? Not everything in the blood affects every different type of cell equally. You got me? So there are chemicals in the blood that will only affect certain cells. And those chemicals, in order to affect a certain cell, have to bind to a specific receptor on the cell membrane. Who's with me? So watch and get this. Here's a heart cell. This is a heart receptor. You got me? Here's a kidney cell, kidney receptor. And here's a liver cell. They got cool receptors. Look at that. Ooh. Are you following me? There's a bunch of chemicals in the blood. Who cares what they are? Doesn't matter right now. Are you with me? Guys? What's important about an enzyme shape? That's right. So you're not going to believe this. The shape of a receptor determines what chemicals can bind to it. Yes or no? You're following me. And because different cells do different things? No, that's beautiful. So watch. I'm making this up. I'm making it up. These are a bunch of chemicals. Say yeah, bless you. Can this chemical here affect a liver cell? Why not? It doesn't have a receptor that matches that shape of the chemical who's with me. Can it affect a kidney cell? What's the only cell it can affect? A heart cell. And when that chemical binds to that receptor, are you with me? It's going to produce some kind of chemical reaction inside that cell. Who cares what it is right now? Tell me you got that. Guys? All right, now watch. Watch. I'm going to name this. This compound right here is called epinephrine. Who's with me? Guys? When epinephrine's released into the blood, what happens to your heart rate and blood pressure? It goes up. Are you with me? So watch. 
Do you always have some sympathetic stimulation and always have some parasympathetic stimulation? So do you always have some epinephrine circulating? Yes, you do. When you're scared, you simply have more. That receptor has a name. Any idea? That's so close. So close. It's called a beta receptor. Are you with me? So watch. What does epinephrine, when it binds to a beta receptor in the heart, what does it do to your heart rate and blood pressure? Do you always have a little epinephrine circulating? Yeah. Yes. So if you go to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, your blood pressure is high. So I'm going to give you a drug that prevents epinephrine from binding to receptors in your heart. And you'll say, okay, I don't know what you're talking about, but you're the doctor. So they will give them a drug that blocks beta receptors in the heart and prevents epinephrine from binding. Say yes. So what will happen to your heart rate and blood pressure? Is there a drug that does that? Yeah. What's it called? What's the class of drug? Beta blocker. It's a beta blocker. Have you ever heard of beta blocker? Mm -hmm. What do beta blockers block? Betas. Go ahead and say that, and I'll mark your whole life wrong and half of your family. <laughs> it blocks up a nephron from binding to that beta receptor. Tell me you got that. Watch this. No one will explain that to you. No one. You get it here, or you don't get it nowhere. Tell me you got that. Back in the day, before they had Prozac and Xanax and Valium, well, they had Valium, they would give people who had anxiety beta blockers. Because when you're anxious, what nervous system is stimulated? So take a beta blocker before you come in for a quiz. Who's with me? Guys, how many people followed this? Did you? That is, of course, beautiful. Let's get back to our cell, right? There's a video on Timmy YouTube videos, and it says how stuff moves into and out of a cell. Did you watch that? On your quiz, you're going to have to explain to me seven ways stuff moves into and out of a cell. So how many ways do you think I'm going to go over? No, I'm only going over six. Too bad for you. Ready? Here we go. Capillary. So this is outside the cell. This is inside the cell. Who's with me? Do all cells need oxygen? Yes. Where's oxygen highly concentrated? In the arterial end of the capillary. What's a byproduct of metabolism that cells have to get rid of and we've talked at nauseum about for the last couple of classes? CO2. God. Where's CO2 highly concentrated? Where do things always go? High to low. High to low. Now watch. Because all cells need oxygen and all cells produce carbon dioxide, it wouldn't make sense to have a special way. Instead, oxygen and carbon dioxide simply diffuse from high to low. So one way that stuff enters or leaves the cell is simple diffusion. And it always goes from high to low. And it doesn't mean it always goes from high in the blood to low in the cell. It's where that stuff is highly concentrated and then lowly concentrated. Say yes. Boom. And you're going to tell me what are the two things that simply diffuse. What are they? And you're going to tell me which way it goes. And we learned, too, and I will never forget it. It was a Monday. I told you that when oxygen leaves the blood and goes into the cell and CO2 leaves the cell and goes into the blood, 
arterial blood becomes what? And where do all the veins of the body dump their venous blood? Right side of the heart. And where does the right side of the heart pump the blood? To the lungs. The, edu the education is continuing. Who's with me? Guys? Yes? Yes or no? All right, here we go. Get this right. Where's sodium highly concentrated? Where's potassium highly concentrated? Where's calcium highly concentrated? In this class, it's in the blood right now. You got me? Can sodium simply diffuse? What does it have to go through? It has to go through the liver? What does it go through? How? Better write this down. I want this whole thing. In order for sodium to go from the blood into the cell, it has to go through a specific protein. This is an example of a structural and functional protein. A protein ion channel. And this protein ion channel is specific. What's the only thing that can go through a sodium protein ion channel? Sodium. And where does sodium go? It, why does it go into the cell? That's right. It moves through a sodium ion channel high to low. Say yes. Who's got me? Guys? How does potassium leave a cell? Through a potassium ion channel. And where does potassium go and why? From the, cell to the blood. From the cell to the blood. Why? Where is it highly concentrated? Where is it lowly concentrated? In the blood. Very good. See? Now watch. I know how you guys try to roll. And Timmy going to put the kibosh on it right now. Ready? Watch. Sodium ion channel, potassium ion channel are not two different ways. They're examples of one way. The education continues. How many people are going to write individual sodium ion channels as three different ways? Anybody? Don't deny it. It'll just upset me. Here we go. That's right. They're examples of one way stuff can enter or leave a cell. How does calcium get into it? Work with me. And where does calcium want to go and why? Why? Tell me you got that. Hi, people are with me. All right, watch. Why is knowing this stuff important? If you're a nurse, are you going to give patients drugs? Yeah. Healthy prescription drugs. How many people have ever had work done on our teeth? Do you want to feel that pain? What do they give you to make sure that you don't feel that pain? They give you the cane families. Say yes. Right? Now watch. Listen up. Don't write this down. Just listen to this. I'm explaining to you why understanding this is important. Watch. In order for a nerve to fire, Sodium from the blood has to leak into that nerve cell, and when it does, it produces an electrical impulse. In this case, if a, doc, a dentist is yanking on your teeth, it's going to send pain signals to your brain like, ouch. Say yeah. You don't want to feel that pain, do you? Good. So they give you a drug called Novocaine or Pontocaine or Tetracaine. Say yeah. The cane family. And you're not going to believe this. It blocks sodium ion channels in nerves. And if sodium can't leak in, do you feel pain? No, you don't. 
Tell me you got that. Watch. NCSI or whatever this show is. See a white bag, right? Yeah. That's cocaine. How do they know? They didn't travel with blood. How would it affect the nerves? How would they know? How did you know? They do, they do cocaine. <laughs> Walk right into that one. Huh? <laughs> it numbs their tongue. Tell me you got that. Who's with me? Now watch. How do people act when they're on cocaine? Okay. It mimics the sympathetic nervous system. I'm just talking now. And the sympathetic nervous system causes all of your blood vessels to constrict. That's why when people snort cocaine, they're looking up your old address. If they do it enough, the blood vessels in their nasal septum remain contracted, and the nasal septum dies. That's why a lot of these movie stars, they end up getting nasoplasty. They have to get an artificial nasal septum because it's trash from snorting cocaine. Write that down. Say, so, yeah. Little kids, when they get cut, especially on the head, do they want a needle coming at them? In the emergency room, they will take a local anesthetic, it's called TAC, tetracaine, atropine, and pharmaceutical grade cocaine. And they'll put it on there. And that local anesthetic will numb that area, then they can suture them up. Tell me you got that. Rock on. Okay, watch. Write this down. This you write down. If you tattoo it, I'll give you extra credit. A real tattoo. How much extra credit? All you're learning. Okay, here, here we go. I know, okay. For quiz, quiz number one, I will give you 150 extra credit points. On top of whatever we were on before? Yep. It has to be a real tattoo and visible. At all times? Yeah, well, I mean, you know. It's got to be on the arm or leg. <laughs> Can I tell you? It wasn't this question, but it was a cardiovascular question. Two students just sat right there. Both of them got tattoos. And I told them I'd get them extra credit. I had to give them ex the extra credit. They were real tattoos. I'm like, you're freaking kidding me. Who does that? You can get it covered up. Well, why? Watch, the time that it took to get the freaking tattoo, they could have studied the stuff. <laughs> Maybe they were studying really good. Right. And then if you do well, you it's extra. You could have been there and read while you're getting a tattoo. Huh? I watched the movie when I got a tattoo. Everybody likes to share about their tattoos, huh? <laughs> <sighs> All right, yeah, 150 extra credit points. I haven't told you what I'm, I want. <laughs> The most important element in muscular contraction is calcium. That's what I want tattooed. You got me? Just the calcium symbol C A. No, I want that whole thing. <laughs> Gonna make it impossible for you. <laughs> What's the most important element in muscular contraction? Calcium. What's the heart made out of? Muscle. What does the heart need? in order for it to contract and pump blood. Calcium. How does calcium get from the blood into a heart cell? A calcium ion channel. Say yes. So if more calcium gets into the heart, it contracts harder. And if it contracts harder, what happens to your blood pressure? Say yes. So if you go into a doctor's office and the doctor says, Dude, you got high blood pressure. I'm gonna give you a drug that lowers your blood pressure. They give you a drug called a calcium channel blocker. What's the most important element in muscular contraction? If less calcium gets into the heart muscle, what's gonna happen to how hard it contracts? So what will happen to your blood pressure? You 
have no idea how good this information is. None. Well, you will. And if you drink the Kool-Aid and pay the price, you're going to be on your way. If you don't, what do you want from me? I did my job. Say so, yeah. What's the second way stuff enters or leaves the cell? I'm waiting. And you're going to tell me calcium, sodium, potassium, and which way they go. And you're always going to include in your answer that they are specific, aren't you? And you're going to tell me which way calcium moves, which way potassium moves, and which way sodium moves. Say, yeah. Okay, what's the goal of the body? If that's the case, then why isn't there equal amounts of sodium and potassium in the blood and sodium and potassium in the cell? Why is there more sodium in the blood and more potassium in the cell? I wish it were that simple. Timmy's going to explain it right now. Ready? Okay. Watch. Timmy will be the blood. You will be the inside of the cell. Are you ready? And we should do this. So this point gets hit home. Every day when you come in, you will give Timmy $3. You got me? And when you leave, Timmy will give you $2 back. At the end of the semester, who's going to be positive and who's going to be negative? That's right. I always make sure it works out that way, too. Maybe we should try that. Maybe 30 and $20 so I can retire early. Are you with me? Listen up. How many people got a sub pump in their house? Watch. If water tries to get into your basement, the pump pumps it out. Say yeah. If your power fails and you ain't got a backup, what happens to your basement? You get a pool. Right, you get a swimming pool because that pump requires energy, don't it? Here we go. I want this, this better be one of those ways. One of the ways that stuff can enter or leave a cell is through a pump that's embedded in all cell membranes. And that pump, and I'm spitballing, pumps sodium and potassium. So what do you think the name of the pump is? Sodium potassium. Are you with me? Now watch. Where does potassium want to go? Where is it highly concentrated? Yeah, you've been tricked, huh? You've been tricked. So potassium will lead through a potassium ion channel high to low. Say yeah. Where's sodium highly concentrated? In the blood. In the blood. Where does it want to go? Into the cell. Boom. You got me? So as potassium is leaking out, the pump takes two potassiums. Who's with me? And pumps them back in. Who's following? And at the exact same time, three sodiums that leaked out, the pump, whoops, it's a bad color. The pump takes three sodiums. You got me? Yep. So it's going to pump in two potassiums and pump out three sodiums. Tell me you got that. Where does sodium want to go normally, naturally? Into the cell. Into the cell. But the pump is pumping it out. So it's going against the concentration gradient. Remember when you were a little kid and you had a little Mr. Turdy pool? Did you ever have a Mr. Turdy pool? 
Forget it. And you make a whirlpool in your pool, and then you kind of ball up and let the current take you. And then you turn around and try to walk against the current, and if you were little, they just blew you wet. Are you with me? To walk against that current, it required energy. To go with the current didn't require energy. Say yes. So anytime you are pumping ions against the concentration gradient, it requires cellular energy. What's the only cellular energy a cell can use? A lot of cells there. ATP. ATP. Tell me you got that. Who's with me? Guys? And watch. Any process the cell uses to move stuff into or out of a cell and it requires energy is called active transport. Active transport is a huge category. The sodium potassium pump is an example of active transport. Why? Because it uses cellular energy. <laughs> Say yes, bless you. you. Who's with me? Yeah or no? Watch. Watch. You need to get this. somebody peed right there. Here we go. What's this? Battery. And rail back. What's that? And what's that? Negative. What can a battery produce? Energy. What kind of energy? I heard it. Electricity. Tell me you got that. So you better write this down. Anytime you have a difference in charge across the cell membrane, meaning the outside is positive and the inside is negative, Mariah, right? That cell has the potential to produce electricity. So the sodium potassium pump is in place to create that difference in charge across the cell membrane. Say yeah. That's why it's not three potassiums and three sodiums. It's two potassiums and three sodiums. Say yeah. Right? That's why you give me three bucks and I only give you two bucks back because I want you, you to be negative. Say yeah. Look, so, somebody peed right there. So what? Right, okay. right. Do you understand? How many people followed that? <laughs> Watch. And that's why I did the $3 and the $2, right? If you give me $3 and I only give you $2 back, who's going to be more positive and who's going to be more negative? So relative to the outside of the cell, the inside of the cell is always negative. Yes or no? Guys? Yes or no? So the, um, the ion channel just does that naturally because the high to low, but then the pump, is that to create energy or just to give No, balance? it uses energy to create the difference in charge across that cell membrane. Okay. Are you with me? Now watch. Watch. How many people get liquored up. Have ever gotten liquored up? Good. You get extra credit. Right. If you go out and party, right, then you stop at McDonald's, get two Big Macs, two large fries, and a Diet Coke. Then you come home, you go to bed, you wake up at the crack of noon, right, and you're like, I'm never doing that again. And then when you're young, at 8 o'clock, your friend goes, you want to go out? Yeah. Watch. When you wake up at the crack of noon, you go into the bathroom, you look in the mirror, like, still look good. Right? When you're young, you can eat a lot. And here's why. When you're young, 
your cells are more leaky to sodium and potassium. So what does the pump have to do in order to maintain concentration of sodium in the blood and potassium in the cell? It has to work harder. And what does it require? Energy. energy. Where do you get that energy from? Energy. Food. As you get older, guess what happens to your cell membranes? <laughs> they get tired. They become less leaky to sodium and potassium. So if they're less leaky, does the pump have to work harder? No, it doesn't, right? If it's less leaky, the pump doesn't have to work. It's working against the concentration gradient. That's why you look at a rice cake and you get five pounds of cellulite on your ass. That's how it works. And that's a fact. Now watch and listen up because this is true. There's a hormone that controls how leaky your cells are to sodium and potassium. That hormone is called thyroid hormone. If your thyroid hormone is high, the cells become more leaky. So what do you do? You lose weight because you're using all that stuff that you ate to make ATP to make that pump work. If you're hypothyroid, cells are less leaky, the pump doesn't have to work as hard, so you gain weight. The education continues. Tell me you got that. And about 30% of everything you put into your pie hole goes to making the sodium potassium pump run in your cells. So the sodium potassium pump determines your basal metabolic rate meaning how many calories you burn at rest. How many people got that? All right. Does the sodium potassium pump require ATP? Yes. yes. So if it requires ATP, it's a form of active transport. You cannot write active transport as a form of a way stuff gets into and out of a cell. That's just a generic term. I want examples, and one example of active transport is the sodium-potassium pump. Say yeah. Simple diffusion ion leak channel sodium-potassium pump. Write this down. I'm not. You're a student. Watch. Watch. In cells that produce electricity, in cells that produce electricity, it's cells that produce electricity. There are specific channels. These specific channels are called voltage-gated channels. What does voltage-gated imply? What does it imply? It implies electricity, right? What parts of your body produce electricity? Your brain and, and your heart, right? Muscles don't produce electricity, right? Nerves signal muscles to contract. So where do you find voltage-gated channels in what cells? Heart cells and nerve cells. Say, so yeah. And watch. They are specific. And I want this. And this is not going to make a lot of sense right now, but you just need to understand this and remember this. Voltage-gated channels are specific. So you have sodium voltage-gated channels, potassium voltage-gated channels, and calcium voltage-gated channels. And I'm going to say this real slow. These voltage-gated channels open up, open and close at a critical voltage inside that cell. Do you understand? And each one of these voltage-gated channels opens and closes at a different critical voltage inside that cell. Who's following this? And unlike voltage-gated, or unlike leak channels, when you open up a voltage-gated channel, ions flood in. If you got a leak, dribble, dribble, right? If you got a flood, Massive pouring of electrolytes into and out of the cell. Say yes. Voltage gated channel specific. Each one opens and closes at a different critical voltage inside that cell. And when they open, ions flood in or out, depending on which one is open. Say yes. Boom. 
How many is that? Four. Four. Very good. Okay, here we go. How many people ate breakfast today? Oh, you got time to eat breakfast, but you ain't got time to study, huh? What's up, G? Yeah, what up, G? Ready? Watch. If you eat sugar, what's going to happen to your blood sugar? It's going to go up. Can glucose simply diffuse from the blood into the cell? In order for glucose to go from the blood into the cell, what do you need? Insulin. And insulin's released by the? And in order for insulin to do its job, what does it have to bind to? What type of cell receptor? An insulin cell receptor. And when insulin binds to that insulin cell receptor, what does it do? What's that gate called? Yeah, you were. You were doing really good, man. Yeah. A glucose gate. That glucose gate actually has a name. Do you want to know what the name is? Do you? No. <laughs> it's called the GLUT4 transport protein. You have to write that. It opens up a glucose gate. Are you with me? And where does glucose go once that gate is open and why does it go there? Why? High to low. Watch. If you need help, like in this class, I'm your facilitator, right? I help you most days. Ready? So glucose can't simply diffuse. It needs help. What helps it? So this is an example of facilitated diffusion. You get, you get a little help from your friends. Say yes. And it, does this require energy? No. Because it's diffusion. It just needs help. Say yes. Guys. How many ways did I give you? Here we go. Yeah. Watch, just so you understand what's going on. See this guy right here, the cell membrane? You with me? Watch. Man, I'm going blind. When I do this, when I do this, This guy right here, this right here, represents this. You understand that? Okay. All right, watch. What's the goal of the body? That's very good. You need to get this. This is all gonna relate, all of it. So I'm gonna be answering questions left and right. I'm not even kidding. They'll just be bouncing off the walls. Ready? These are terms that you're going to have to understand. Number one is osmosis. You with me? The other one is osmolarity. Say yeah. And the other one is osmotic pressure. Who's following me so far? All right. The first one I'm going to tackle is osmolarity. What you need to understand and you need to get into your head is osmolarity is a measurement. So you can actually measure the osmolarity of the blood, the osmolarity of urine. Tell me you got that. And in your book, that evil thing, osmolarity is defined as solute over solvent. How does Timmy define it? There you go. Stuff over water. 
If it ain't water, it's what? Stuff. Tell me you got that. All right. So, all right, here's some math. I forgot the volume in my Jeep. I don't want you guys to seize. Here we go. And here's here's the real important thing. It don't make no never mind the stuff. Do you understand that? It don't make no never mind the stuff. And I'll show you, give you an example. Watch. If you wanted to increase osmolarity, if you wanted to increase the osmolarity of a solution, what are the two things you could do? You could increase the stuff and keep the water the same right or you could keep the stuff the same and do what to the water decrease it say yes that's how you increase osmolarity are you with me okay here we go what's osmolarity it's a measurement right now what's the goal of the body you you need this stuff's exciting I'm killing it, man. Ready? What part of your brain controls hunger, temperature, thirst? Or HTL or P. Diddy or just Diddy? Better write this down. Embedded in the HTL, you got these little receptors called? Yeah. Osmoreceptors. What do osmoreceptors recept? Osmoreceptors detect changes in osmolarity. Are you with me? Guys? Where's sodium highly concentrated? My name is? Where's potassium highly concentrated? Ready? What I'm telling you in this picture is that the osmolarity of the blood and the osmolarity of the cell are equal. You're in homeostasis. Are you following me? After class, you go to the purple sombrero, whatever that is, and they have the peanuts and pretzels out in the dishes, and no one with any dirty, boogery fingers have ever put their hands in those dishes at all. Those are good eats. What's going to happen to the amount of sodium in the blood? It's going to go up. Where is the osmolarity higher in this picture? In the blood. Where is it lower? Now remember, if stuff can't move, what can always move? And where will water always move? A lot of answers out there. Watch. This is what I want. Where is it low osmolarity? Cell. The cell. Where is it high osmolarity? If stuff can't move, water will always move in. It will always move from low osmolarity through a selectively permeable membrane to high osmolarity until the osmolarity of the blood and the cell are equal. Say yes. When you remove water, uh oh, here it comes. When you remove water from the hypothalamus and the stuff stays the same, what happens to the osmolarity in the H cell? It goes. See? It goes what? Oh. That was your other choice. <laughs> How do you increase osmolarity? You can keep the stuff the same and decrease the water. Say yes. yes. So what are you doing in this picture? What are you doing? You're taking water from the aid style and removing it. Are you removing any stuff? So what happens to the osmolarity? It goes up. And any time you increase osmolarity in the H-style, are you with me? That stimulates osmoreceptors 
and tells you to drink. That's why eating salt makes you thirsty. Who's with me? You're following this. Watch another clinical thing. Listen up because this is true. Where's your uh, sodium level high in the blood? Where? Where in the body? Right. Where does blood circulate? Your heart. I, I better tell you. It circulates all over to every cell of your body, right? So, our, watch. Are all the cells of your body experience high sodium levels? Yes. yes. Good. That's why I put a bunch of sodium in there. So all the cells are experiencing that high sodium. So what's going to happen to all of the water in all of your cells? It's going to move because it's going to move from low osmolarity through a selectively permeable membrane to high. Say yes. And you better write this down. Better not pout. Anytime you increase your blood volume, you increase your blood pressure. That's why people with high blood pressure are told not to eat a lot of sodium. Say yes. The only thing that osmosis is, is what? Water. So what's another way stuff can move into and out of a cell? Osmosis. And you're going to tell me how it works, aren't you? Say yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Watch. Write this down. People, if you read this in the book and you get this, you're really good. You got me? So I'm going to explain it my way, and maybe it will help. Ready? I'm going over the concept of osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is the ability of stuff to draw water towards it by osmosis. What are you eating? I know it's good. Is it chocolate? What are you eating? <laughs> it's the ability of stuff to draw water towards it by osmosis. Say yes. You're with me. Okay, so watch. Watch. I'm going to say this really slow and in Spanish if I can. Tesura la nariz. You know what I just said? You have a sweaty nose. I work with this lady at the company. Eh? Just real quick. I can tell you this story. She worked in the manufacturing area. Her name was Elizabeth Rodriguez. She died of pancreatic cancer about four years ago. And I told her that she had it. And she didn't believe me. And she ended up dying. But anyways, it could be 95 below zero. And she would always have these little beads of sweat on her nose. So I asked one of the other ladies, go, how do you say you have a sweaty nose in Spanish? <laughs> so that's what I'd say to her. Now, I guess you had to be there. <clears throat> Mariah, you're looking at me like I'm insane. That's okay. I have those looks before. Can I show you how ghetto I am real quick? You got to wear a belt. So I took this cord and I tied it. Oh, we had that one? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I couldn't find a tourniquet. Here we go. Look. Maybe you need a belt for Christmas instead of a thick golf clubs. Golf clubs and no belt. No Fitbit. You're getting a belt. Don't hate. Ready? Appreciate it. Here we go. Watch. 
Watch. If stuff can't move, what can always move? So what's going to have the greater osmotic pressure, the blood or the cell? The blood. the blood. Because I just told you, osmotic pressure is the ability of stuff to draw water towards it by osmosis. Ain't that right? And you better get this. It don't make no never mind the stuff. It don't make no never mind how big the stuff is. The only thing that matters is the number of stuffs. I cannot be any clearer with that. I can't be any clearer than that. How many people got that? Yes or no? Watch. And now it, it'll hopefully make a little more sense. How big is sodium? Okay, how big is sodium compared to, say, insulin? Is sodium bigger or smaller than insulin? A lot. Sodium's a freaking atom. Insulin's a big freaking protein. Say yeah. Are you following? There's a big freaking protein in your blood called? Nice. It is so big, where is it only found? In the blood. Sodium, little, 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 tiny, tiny. Albumin, big. Yeah. Watch. Sodium and albumin exert the same ability to draw water towards it by osmosis. Do you understand that? So it's not the size, it's the number. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Are you with me? Guys? Yes or no? So, where is sodium and albumin? Right, and what's this blood vessel called? A capillary. So, what two things determine capillary osmotic pressure? The only two things that are in the capillary right now. There you go. Wee. Tell me you got that. Guys, so watch. Anything that's going to affect the level of sodium or albumin in the blood is going to affect the ability to draw fluid back into the capillary. Say yes. Who, who's with me? I need glasses. I need a lot of stuff. I'm a mess. But I don't care. You know why? Hmm? Yeah. That too. Hang on. What was I going to show you? Oh, I got it. You should know this. How many people had general? You had to. Otherwise, you'd be sitting in this class. Listen to this. Listen to it. For the most part, wherever you have arteries and veins, you have lymphatic vessels. Lymphatic vessels work like the sewer system of the body. Any fluid that escapes the cardiovascular system and doesn't enter the cell gets drained back to the right side of the heart through the lymphatic system. Are you with me? Now watch, I'm going to show you something. in my legs, right? Because gravity is creating pressure. Tell me you got that. So if you stand up all day, then that pressure of blood in the capillaries gets pushed out of the cardiovascular system. Who's following? 
And if the lymphatic system can't drain it back to the right side of the heart, that fluid accumulates and you get swollen ankles and feet. Are you with me? Yeah. Say yeah. So this is the important piece. Your central nervous system doesn't have a lymphatic system. So if fluid starts accumulating in the brain, is there a way to effectively drain it off? No. Is your brain soft compared to your skull? Yes. So if fluid starts accumulating in your brain, your skull ain't going to go like this. Your brain's going to go like this. Tell me you got that. So fluid shifts in the brain are devastating. This is a true story. 1991, I did the Canadian Ironman triathlon. Two and a half miles swim, bike 112, run a marathon. I can't even drive my car 26 miles without having to take a break. Now, get like a wedgie or something. Anyways, my buddy, here's a guy who didn't know his limitations. He's like, oh, I'll do it with you. I trained four hours, or four days a week, eight hours a day to do that thing. He didn't train but 20 minutes. Are you following? Watch. Michael Jordan, when he comes back for the second half of basketball, does he have a salt ring here? People are in really good shape. They just sweat water. So yeah, people are in bad shape, like refrigerator repairman, right? When they come back from break, they got the salt ring, and then they got the brown stains, because you actually release urea in your sweat and the bacteria in your skin break it down. That's why people stink when they sweat. Except me. I smell like a rose. I hate me too. Are you with me? Yes? So watch. This guy was sweating like a pig, but he thought he could do it. And what he was doing is he was sweating and losing a lot of sodium, but all he was doing is replacing it with water. Ready? If you have low sodium, L we'll call it, albumin, your sodium level drops. Tell me you got that. Where is the osmotic pressure the greatest now? In the cell. In the cell. So where is water going to go? It's going to go from the capillary into the brain cells because water always moves from low osmolarity through a selectively permeable membrane to high. Say yes. And the brain doesn't have a lymphatic system, so what does your brain do? It swells and you die. He died that weekend. He died that weekend. Yep, 28 years old. Boom. There was an incident a couple years ago, radio show. Who can drink the most water and not have to pee? Lady did it. She drank water. So she diluted her blood. So her sodium level dropped. Her brain swelled and she died. That's why low sodium would be bad for you. Tell me you got that. How many people followed that? Here we go. Yep. Like a sidebar. So when they tell you to drink eight, eight fluid ounces a day, is that what they have factored out as a healthy range? It, yes, watch. You lose water through urine, breathing, sweating. It's called insensible loss. Like you're losing water right now through sweat glands, but you don't even know it. The only time you really know is when sweat's pouring off you, right? So this is how you determine if you are hydrated. When you take a leak, if it is clear or a very, very light yellow, you are adequately hydrated. If it is a dark yellow, you are dehydrated. Your body does stuff that makes sense, right? If you ain't taking in enough fluid, 
you're not going to say, hey, I got to take a leak every five minutes. The kidney's going to hold on to that water and only get rid of what it needs to get rid of. Say yes. So drink water and reading the textbook keeps you hydrated. Here we go. What's the highest your blood sugar ever gets, ever gets, if you're not a diabetic? 120. When you, ooh, a little higher. 180. Tell me you got that. Watch. If your blood sugar is 500, I'm just making up a number, 500, what are you? Dying. You're what? Dying. Yeah, but what, what caused it? Well, and what does that make you? A diabetic. Whoa. Say yeah. Watch. What up, G? If you say what up, G, on your quiz, I'll give you extra credit. How much extra? Good answer. Good qu or good question. I will give you um, I'll give you an extra five points. Per time. Dude, you know what? On when is it? today's Wednesday, right? But Monday. Bring a tin cup and a monkey, man. He's a guy, you're begging. Come on. Every time. That's all you sit there all class. All right, who cares about the quiz? I'll write this nine hundred times. What up, G? <laughs> no, five points total. Don't waste your time. Mm -hmm. Who's with me? If your blood sugar's 500, can glucose go from the blood into the cell? No. Why not? You need, you need insulin. Say yes. So if stuff can't move, what can always move? So... In your H thou cell, say yes. Who's with me? Where's water gonna move? Why? Low to high what? Oh, uh, low to high what? Uh, oh, yeah, okay. It's gonna go from low osmolarity through a selectively permeable membrane to. High osmolarity. And when you remove water from the hypothalamus, please get this, what happens to the osmolarity? Yeah, we just covered that one. It goes up. And any time you increase osmolarity within the H cell, it stimulates thirst. That's why diabetics get thirsty. Watch. If you've ever gone in for a physical, like a complete physical, you have to figure out, fill out that health history. The doctor will ask, do you have uh, increased thirst? How many times at night you get up and go pee? Because if you answer yes to these questions, they're going to worry about the fact that you may have diabetes. Say yes. Watch. Where's your blood sugar high? In the blood. <laughs> okay. I won't give you that one. I need to be more specific. Is your blood sugar high only in the capillaries of your hypothalamus? It's high where? Everywhere. Everywhere. So what's happening to all the fluid in the cells of your body? I can't even write what up G anymore. What's happening? All cells are having their water pulled out by the osmotic effect of glucose right because you have increased osmotic pressure in the blood so water's gonna go and you better write this down I'm not even playing anytime you increase your blood volume regardless of how you increase your blood pressure say yes and anytime you increase your blood pressure in a resting state it makes you pee more that's why they pee more say yeah Yes or no? It makes total sense. How long is this class today? Two hours? Right, it's because we did it, uh, we switched, right? Okay, and every, you're okay with that? All right. Tell me you got that. 
What's the only fuel the brain can use? If you don't have insulin, can you get glucose from the blood into the brain? So what the hypothalamus thinks is that you're starving. That's why the three classic polys of diabetes are polyurea, peeing a lot, polydipsy, you're drinking a lot, and polyphagia, you're eating a lot. Boom. But if then your blood sugar just goes up again. So could that be a positive? Don't even think like that. Don't listen to that. Don't listen to that. Don't write that. Good. How many people followed that? You got that. Now watch. If you want to actually learn something, then you need to understand this. Watch. I explained all of that stuff with knowing osmosis and diffusion. If you don't understand that, you will spend the rest of your life as a nurse trying to remember these signs and symptoms. Say yes. Now watch. Watch how simple this is. If you're working in an emergency room and a doc, the EMTs call it and say, Savoy 6, Savoy 6, you know, this is Bulldog, right? And they say, we've got a person we're bringing into the emergency room and their blood sugar is 800. What are you going to get ready? You're going to give insulin ready and you're going to get big IVs ready, right? because you have to rehydrate those cells. Tell me you got that. Mm -hmm. Now watch. People are like, we don't have to know this stuff. We just wait till the doctor tells us what to do. In an emergency room, all right? I know, it's a joke, right? If you ain't ready to act, that person dies. Mm -hmm. So, and if you don't know it, then what they do is they get sick of you like in 13 seconds, and they spin you around and they go, and they punch your ass out of there and then you go find a job at a nursing home or something like that. Say yeah. And I'm gonna tell you this, and this much is true. Only the best nurses survive in the ICU and the ER. Cause you gotta know it. So if your dream is being an ER nurse and you don't know this stuff, <clears throat> start practicing lines like, it'll be okay, sweetie. We'll get you up. We'll get you to the commode. <laughs> That's what you're going to be. And you think I'm lying. You watch and watch. Doctors don't like their time wasted because doctors are paid based on how many patients they see a day. So if you don't know what you're doing, they get rid of you because they're going to find someone who does because you've got a good nurse. They make your life easier and they make you more money. Yep, the education continues. Bum. How many people got that? Man, I'm killing these questions. We could probably have the quiz today. When's the quiz? I'm telling you right now. 3,000 students, 15 years, five classes a semester. I don't know what that comes out to, but that's a lot. If you don't do good on quiz one, you need to reevaluate your commitment to this class because everything that we're going to be talking about the rest of the semester is based off principles you learned in quiz number one. And I'm just being real with you. Boom. Okay. Watch, 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 watch. Define homeostasis. Done. Why would their uh, skin become uh, cool and pale if you lost a lot of blood? Why would a person's skin become cool and pale? You're, right, you're going to do that better, though, right? <laughs> we learn more, though. Watch. Is getting shot or stabbed stressful? Yes. What's the purpose of the sympathetic nervous system being activated? To prepare the body to run or fight, or to prepare the body to survive. Tell me you got that. What happens to your heart rate and blood pressure? What happens to all of the arteries in the non-essential parts of the body that are not involved in running or fighting? Or if you're bleeding, they could strip. Tell me you got, can you live without your arms and legs? Yes. You can't live without your liver. So all of those arteries will constrict 
to the non-essential parts of the body, so the cardiovascular system will send the remaining blood to the core. Say yeah. yeah. Watch it. Think now. What's going to happen to a person's urine output if they're bleeding, and why? It's going to increase. Why would it decrease? Do you want to be peeing out blood volume, plasma, when you're bleeding to death? No. So your kidneys will shut down. They won't make any urine at all. If you're bleeding bad enough, say yeah. How many people got that? And remember, this is very important. Nobody makes me be bleed my own blood. Nobody. I hate me too. Here we go. I did that. Eight. Okay, listen up. I'm here to help you. Forget about dynamic equilibrium. People write about the ear. Tell me you weren't going to write about the ear. Tell me you weren't going to write about the ear. Were you going to write about the ear? Uh, osmotic pressure. I explained osmotic pressure, didn't I? Didn't I? What two substances determine capillary osmotic pressure? That's very good. If you get this right, extra credit. What organ produces albumin? That's right. See, Roland, you, you needed to ask how much. See, kind of getting into a habit. So you get plus one point of extra credit. See? <laughs> Can I tell you something? If your grade comes down to a point, I'm giving it to you. Do you understand? I ain't going to nickel and dime me to death, right? But remember, a 61 ain't an 83. Limits. All right, here we go. Watch. Write this down. If you get this tattooed, this would probably be worth getting tattooed. Ready? <clears throat> when an organ fails, all the functions of that organ fail. What organ produces albumin? What two things determine capillary osmotic pressure? That's very good. Have you ever heard of peritoneal dialysis? Yeah. Write this down. One of the best dialyzing membranes you have, one of the best selectively permeable membranes you have in your body, is that big hefty bag? that wraps your or abdominal organs. What's it called? The peritoneal membrane. Say yeah. There we go. God, I wish I could see. I'm going to draw a picture for you. It's going to be a good one. What's this? Good. What's this? Oh, this is a new one. Yeah, that's nice. This is the peritoneal membrane. Is the peritoneal membrane selectively permeable? Is it? Say yes. It's one of the best you have. Good. <laughs> That's your belly. He's got Audi. Now watch. Is there stuff floating around in the fluid of your abdominal cavity? Say yes. Good. Watch. What two things determine capillary osmotic pressure? Right. Does it matter the size? It's the what? The number. You got me? When an organ fails, all the functions of that organ fail. True or false? Good. So if you're a boozer and your liver's going on the fritz, what is the liver going to stop making? 
Right, because I was erasing it. That's how you know. So where is there low osmolarity and where is there high osmolarity? And if stuff can't move, what can always move? Water. And water is always going to move from an area of low osmolarity through a selectively permeable membrane to an area of high osmolarity. Say yes. yes. So what's going to happen to Jasper's belly? It's going to get folded. Watch. People think, oh, that's a beer belly, right? That ain't fat. That's fluid. And how doctors test for it is you lay the patient down and you push on it. And it will actually wave back and forth. Some doctors, if they have time, will take a script, make it into a boat, and then do a little sand. I hate me too. Tell me you got that. Now watch. That abdominal fluid, when it builds up, it pushes up on the diaphragm and they can't breathe. So they stick a needle in there and they draw that fluid out. And the only reason they're doing that is to allow that person to breathe. It will come back. If you got ascites, you are about to take a six foot dirt nap. Your liver is gone. It's gone. Say, yeah. Now, what they will do, they will ask the patient, well, what was your choice of drink? And then they will put that specific tapper on there. Like if it was old style, they'll put an old style tapper. <laughs> I hate me too. <laughs> Had a student come on, Tim, do they really do that? No. <laughs> All right, here we go. A couple years ago, I had the students, the class, convinced that you couldn't live without your gallbladder. I had them convinced. Now watch. If you say something with enough confidence, people will believe you. Watch. Tim, why do you get the munchies when you smoke marijuana? Now I know the real reason, but this is the reason I gave them. I go, uh, the active ingredient in uh, pot is uh, tetrahydrocannabinoid. And that decreases insulin sensitivity. The result is, is it can't get glucose from the blood into the brain, so you get the munchies. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. I go, I just made that up. <laughs> but watch, if I make something up, I'm always going to tell you I make something up. I will. Unless I don't want you to know. What? Do you think I'm making this stuff up? Huh? Do you think I am? You're kidding. Well, stuff and water. Look, you want me to use the terminology in the no, book no, that you don't no, read? No. All right, Dad. <laughs> right, and that's the whole point, right? If I can use big words and you don't understand them, I didn't do my job. Are these kids boozers? No. They don't have, instead of a 40, they got a little four? This is called Kwashkora. This is what the people believe. They believe that it's the evil spirit that infects the first child when the second child is born, right? What doesn't the first child get to do anymore after the second child is born? They don't get to breastfeed. When you go to the grocery store, pick and save, or maybe festival foods, what's the most expensive thing there? Formula or? When you go, what's the most expensive thing in a grocery store? <laughs> Meat. Where do you get your protein? Meat. These kids are poor. Do they get to eat steak and, I don't know, Salisbury steak and mashed potatoes every night? No. They eat mush that's very low in protein. And what's albumin made out of? Protein. So if you ain't eating protein, the liver doesn't have any building blocks, those amino acids to build albumin. And the fluid shifts. Bam.
The education continues. The difference with these kids, you take them to McDonald's, the drive through two Big Macs, two large orders of fries, and a Diet Coke. In two weeks, the liver will stop manufacturing albumin. Water gets sucked out of their belly. They pee like a racehorse for a few weeks, and they are straight. The dude who got it from liquor, he's on his way out. He won't take a six-foot dirt nap. Uh, stunted growth <clears throat> and uh, uh, poor brain development. A lot of these kids who are starved like this, they um, are slow mentally. Yeah. You know what always bothers me? Is that you can communicate with people from around them all over the place, right? All this stuff. And there are still people who are starving. How, how does that work? How does that work? I don't know. No, I'm going golfing. You know what I'm going to do when I retire? <laughs> I'm going to be a golf ranger on the golf course because you get to golf for free. Then drive around the car. Hey, you're playing slow. Hey, pick your divots. Let's go. You got any beer? Yeah. It's fun. That's what I want. And no more future making. I'm done. I made my futures. Then I am be late home. <laughs> Wait. We did good today. Hang on. What the hell is that? Man, I cannot see. What? Okay. Watch. Osmotic pressure. Explain the reason a patient and liver failure develops ascites. I did that, didn't I? Yeah, yeah I did. Osmolarity did that. Four pressures. Um, I'll cover that later. Um, okay, you know what? I think that's good. We did good today. All right, watch. How many people watch the video on um, iso, hypo, and hypertonic? How many people know it, get it, understand it? You're going to watch it again, and I'm, I'm going to go over it on Monday. Say yeah. And then um, make sure you watch the... Uh, structure of DNA, cancer, I'm telling you right now, everyone sitting in this class had general. And everyone sitting in this class went over the cell and the structure of the cell. You got me? I'm not going over that in class. I made a video on that. You watch that. That's what I want. Say yeah. And then um, uh, there's a video. Oh, I, I didn't tell you this. I'm telling you this. Um, number 21 is extra credit. I'm not going over it. I want to see what I get for an answer. Well, a well done question. Listen up, well done question. It's worth uh, 100 points. Tell me you got that. We know which way the equation goes, don't we? Right? That one, 250. You blow that one, look on WebAdvisor for horticulture. Say yeah. Guys? Okay. Ambulate. Don't hate.